Welcome to this week's Sand Pile, which we've uh, we've called the Tool Show. We'll start off the week here with uh, with some announcements. Get that over on this screen. So, in the BC Academy, coming up this week, uh, Scott Shuffer did a interesting tutorial on the Mailchimp subscribe form plugin. So it's a, just a handy little Mailchimp subscribe form plugin, which you, allows you to subscribe visitors to a Mailchimp list as well as subscribe them to the mailing list in Business Catalyst at the same time. So it makes uh, this plugin makes it easy to integrate with your default BC forms. So we use that at Chicago Digital all the time, and it just subscribes them both to the the Mailchimp and to the the Business Catalyst mailing list, uh, kind of as a fallback or a backup. So that's coming out this week. On the BC Guru side, there's a new tutorial by uh, Scott Reynolds called Sorting Techniques for All Skill Levels. So in this tutorial, he's going to learn uh, both basic and advanced sorting techniques. Each video is going to contain a, like a practical walkthrough of how to sort in Business Catalyst. So first, he'll show you some of the default sorting methods with, with module tags, and then the videos will start getting more advanced with topics such as module data, liquid markup, and sorting blocks of HTML. So I'm looking forward to that one myself even. That's pretty cool. And I know there's been some, uh, some challenges on the BC Guru side getting some things released and, and perhaps not necessarily meeting some expectations, but there, I'm aware of some steps that have been put in place to, uh, to resolve that. And we should uh, see a resumption of the regular schedule where we're having a major tutorial and a tips and tricks tutorial every month and a template being released every month. So I'm looking forward to that consistency again as well. We don't have any updates in the BC App Store, still that uh, Zapier integration from CBO from last week, as a reminder. We do have, uh, I received an email from Code Production uh, because I'm on their mailing list. They just released a new template called Senior Care. So if you haven't seen that, it's codeproduction.co and then uh, Senior Care BC template. Maybe I'll paste that into the chat here. Is anyone else aware of any other news from the industry? Well, you may be replying. Uh, just looking at the Business Catalyst system status timeline, looks like the scheduled maintenance uh, we talked about last week was completed a couple of days ago on the Sunday. Everything went successfully and there's, uh, there's no further updates. So I think those updates are done, which is good. Cool, let me share my screen then. We'll get into these. Uh, the tool show. Just let me bring up the chat again. I don't know why it takes my chat window away when I share my screen, but it does. Okay, so again, I want to just say thank you to everybody here who who replied. Fifty five responses, I think, is is pretty amazing these days. For, uh, for sending out uh, just a random survey asking for some participation. So I'm real pleased with that. I, I was just uh, elated to get that kind of result. So I thought we just, uh, we'll just go through the questions and then as discussion gets generated, we can, we can talk about it. The first item was the, uh, the code editor. And probably not a big surprise, but Dreamweaver was, was far and away the, the primary code editor being used by folks, followed by brackets and then sublime. I know I use brackets uh, sometimes, and uh, once they pull it into Dreamweaver, I kind of went back to Dreamweaver, and I'm I'm torn. Uh, Dreamweaver seems a little heavy. I, I do, you know, I like it for the for the FTP side of things, and uh, other than that, I probably would just continue to use brackets. I don't know. I see a little bit of Visual Studio. I know uh, Scott Reynolds has been trying to use Visual Studio. He was using Atom for a while. And then there's a bunch of other ones there, WebStorm, Firebug Lite, uh, Visual Studio Code. Must, must be different. Uh, they're implying that it's different from the IDE. Uh, Emmet is an extension. Certainly you can have that in brackets or Dreamweaver or Sublime, and I definitely do use Emmet. Uh, only one person put in the Develop tab. I, I do definitely use the Develop tab for working on live sites myself. Uh, sometimes it's just easier than uh, than having to FTP down whatever the latest changes are, make your change, and then FTP it back up again. If it's a relatively simple change, I just use the de developer tab. Another one using the develop tab. Not sure what code means. Maybe they meant Coda. 
Uh, one person said Muse, Emacs, Text Wrangler. I've Wrangler, right? Wrang, Wrangler, Wrangler. I've never heard of that one actually. And then the Business Catalyst Editor, which is fine. So I probably no surprises there for you folks, but uh, like almost 40, 71 percent used uh, used Dreamweaver. This one was uh, was fairly interesting to me. Are you regularly using a preprocessor like SAS or less? And I actually thought it would be higher. So 60% are saying no, 20% uh, are saying sometimes, and only really 20% are using a preprocessor on a regular basis. So it could just be the audience. Maybe it's more of a straight developer tool and, and maybe, maybe straight developers are not necessarily participating in the sound pile, it's hard to say, but I was a bit surprised by that. I thought the, uh, the preprocessor, yes, would be, would be higher. Probably not a surprise here either. The primary browser used when building or updating sites is Chrome. Almost 70% are using Chrome. 20% uh, are Firefox. Very few, less than 10% using Safari. And then it goes down from there. Uh, I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure Internet Explorer shows up there. <laughs> it must have 1% somewhere, but it's not showing up on the graph. Yeah, Bill says uh, Scott's foundation builder uses SAS, but that wasn't uh, an option. And that's true. That's true. Um, I'm not sure I would say that's building the site. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you that, Bill. I'll give you that today. Feeling generous. Anybody surprised by this browser? I thought maybe Firefox would be higher. I don't use it myself, but I thought, uh, I thought the industry in general was using it more. Uh, frameworks, almost a dead, dead heat, dead tie here for foundation and bootstrap. I must say, as I was watching the responses come in, um, the first batch, probably the first half or, or 60%, the foundation was significantly higher and then the, the bootstrap folks chimed in. So I'm actually starting to wonder if the bootstrap folks aren't necessarily, maybe are, are from, uh, just based on the timing of the emails, if they're perhaps out in Australia or, or parts thereabouts. Um, maybe you guys can comment on that. So again, foundation was, was the early lead and then the, the bootstrap stuff came in later. And that's just, as I know from when the emails go out, I think, uh, I think the email comes out while the Australian folks are, are asleep. So I'm, I was kind of speculating on that. I wondered only six folks doing a, some kind of a custom framework skeleton, I used Skeleton a while back and, and it was okay, but pretty minimal, but I see one person still using it. Easy BC code production, uh, some smart, smart Alec put WordPress, <laughs> which is fine. It's fine. Uh, we got to look at everything these days. Templates and themes, Dreamweaver fluid grid layouts. And this one was 70% uh, bootstrap, 20% foundation, 5% skeleton, 5% other. Uh, I won't put a name on who I think that might be, but. And I wanted to have a look at code repositories. And again, if you guys have comments or opinions, either chime in or just uh, grab the mic and, and interrupt me, that's just fine. It's not, uh, not meant to be a talking head. So code repositories, uh, GitHub, Cacher, Dropbox, Google Drive. I know at Chicago Digital, we've moved from GitHub to Cacher, and I've been pretty happy with it. Took a little bit of getting used to, but uh, pretty happy with it for a code repository. And we've uh, we moved largely from Dropbox to Google Drive. And I'm actually happier myself with Dropbox. Uh, I've had to move to Google Drive for because the team is on that. And it's been okay, but uh, it seems to at times make my computer chug, particularly if I'm, uh, if I'm handling videos. It, uh, it definitely seems to slow me down a bit where Dropbox seemed to be able to, to throttle things enough that it, it wasn't so much of an impact. That's my personal opinion. We have a mix of Creative Cloud teams, Microsoft OneDrive, iCloud, local server, Office 365, NAS, currently internal but moving to Git, in-house, Amazon Web Services, Code Commit, and Bitbucket. So I doubt that there's any surprises in that particular result. For FTP, 
kind of a tie between FileZilla and then whatever's built in with their with their code editor. So, I mean, I definitely use uh, Dreamweaver in brackets. I, I definitely use the built-in FTP. Uh, I use FileZilla sometimes if I'm doing a whole site or, or particularly if I know there's large images or uh, sometimes I work on HTML emails and they have to go up to a development server somewhere. So I'll connect that up with FileZilla, those kind of things. But uh, those really are the same the tools that I use. Uh, CyberDuck, I, I wonder if that was Scott replied that. I know he uses it sometimes. I was using Transmit. I thought it was Transit. But uh, I looked it up and it is Transmit. So it might have got renamed. I tried that for a little while. wasn't real happy with it. Uh, fetch, yummy FTP, forklift, and WSFTP, whatever that is. So this FileZilla thing, uh, because that's Mozilla, that's kind of why I'm a little bit surprised that uh, more people aren't necessarily using Fire, Firefox. So. Font packages, 80%. 80%. Does that make sense? It can't be right because 80, oh, some people probably would have answered two. That's right. I forgot that wasn't a radio. That was a checkbox. So Google Fonts and Typekit uh, with Google Fonts being the, the majority there. Fonts.com are uploaded from our own collection. That was just one person. So I, I will occasionally, if, uh, if there are fonts that aren't available on Google Fonts or Typekit, well, then I'll ask the designers to provide the, the licensed fonts and do that, build it up in Font Squirrel. But for the most part, we try and use first Google Fonts, and if not that, then Typekit. Uh, Typekit's got a bit better now in the last little bit. We don't have that flash of unstyled text uh, so that we have to deal with necessarily anymore. So maybe that's going to change over time. But that's uh, that's the way it is. Icon libraries, Font Awesome, and then Icomoon. So definitely Font Awesome. And I forget who uh, in the group here told me about version five. Uh, where they're using SVG, and I've been playing with that. I had a site. Uh, I had a site that I built on that. Let me see. And all I really did was I, I took what, uh, I was just playing a little on my BC Academy dev site, but I just took what was on the Font Awesome site and, and just started to play with it. And you can do some really interesting things. So uh, for those that haven't gone over to, to Font Awesome to their SVG stuff, it's definitely worth having a look at it. So I, yeah, I just really went to this page and I kind of just grabbed all their, all their little snippets of code and kind of put them all on one page just to kind of play with them. Yeah, this, this motion is, is very cool. You can resize the icons. Uh, there's backgrounds on there so you can kind of see what, what you're doing with them by raising it up, moving it to the right, to the left. It's pretty cool. Uh, even this, this 1.419 is, is done with, uh, with, with code. There's no, you're, no longer, you're no longer placing a little bit of text and then using CSS to absolutely position stuff. It's all done through the font thing, so it's pretty cool. So that uh, was Jeremiah. Thanks, Jeremiah. Yeah, it's been really good. Uh, Line Awesome is one I uses a bit. That's fine. Aaron uh, suggests to be careful with Font Awesome 5. Big file if you load everything. So uh, you need to load only what you might need. That's probably good advice all around. And you just have to be selective. Yeah, all things in moderation, sure. Uh, that's, what my, that's what my AA counselor told me, all things in moderation. Every team at uh, FA5 doesn't, even the team at FA5 doesn't recommend loading the entire library. Yeah, so that's fair enough. Good advice all around. Cool. So no, again, no real surprises. We do use Icomoon a fair bit at, uh, at Chicago Digital and it's been good. Uh, we've got a kind of a standard library that we use and we have processes and, and not, like we understand how to adjust it. So. That's likely why we keep using it. Um, it works for us, but I, I think over time we're going to wind up uh, maybe, especially with the SVG stuff, we're maybe moving to, to the Font Awesome side of things. That uh, must have been you, uh, Jeremiah, with the Font Awesome 5 Pro. 
I'm just speculating. Vectors, design your own. Interesting, some folks are still designing their own. That's, uh, that's powerful stuff. If, from, a, from a branding perspective, that's cool if you can have somebody on staff to do that for sure. Google Material Design and the Noun Project. Image libraries, there was some interesting stuff here. Adobe Stock, half of you are using Adobe Stock. A quarter are using Shutterstock. Some of them a little bit less than that are iStock and then a, a bunch of other things. Lots of folks are using placehold.it. Uh, Lorem Pixel, I use that myself sometimes. And then a bunch of uh, one-offs here, if you will. I'm uh, impressed that someone takes their own pictures. That's always best if you can do it. Someone just uses whatever they can get. That's fine. Canstock, Storyblocks, Envato, Deposit Photos, Unsplash. Um, I, I, I use Unsplash sometimes, for sure, especially when I was looking at uh, doing the templates and stuff. It was, uh, it was a place to get some decent pictures. Big Stock, Wonder 3 RF, Pixel Bay, Getty, Shutterstock, Photodune. Probably no real surprises there. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. I'm, I'm kind of surprised at uh, Adobe Stock. And maybe it's because they were careful to, to give so many people a number of free ones. And that, uh, that kind of got them started on it. I know when we went to Adobe Max there one year, uh, we got like 100 free images as part, of the, as part of the deal just for going to Max. And since then, they've offered uh, occasionally 10 here and 10 there. So maybe that's why. And of course, uh, you, I think you get a certain amount with your license now too, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe that's why. That is, it's decent stuff. So then we come to, are you regularly using SVGs? And that seems to be kind of split up, 30, 30, 30. And I guess the sometimes kind of counts half for yes, half for no. So probably safe to say 50, 50. In uh, full disclosure, I've really only just started using SVGs uh, on purpose in the last little while here, and, and I've enjoyed using them. Definitely some challenges. Uh, Bill says, uh, back to images, Flickr with commercial uses allowed. Definitely some challenges with the SVG. You have to be uh, more specific about sizing and that kind of thing. It tends to, uh, tends to fill up your containers otherwise, but once you get used to that and, and figure out how to, how to handle them, you definitely get uh, nice, sharp, clear results, which is the whole purpose. <coughs> a little bit of work to figure out how to change colors, but once you figure that out, uh, it's nice that you can, you can change colors of the SVG on hover and those kind of things, so that's not bad. A graphics editor, you know, again, shouldn't be any big surprise. I was more interested to see myself how many people are using Sketch. Uh, we've been using Sketch for the last uh, number of months, maybe six to 12 months, maybe a bit longer. So definitely Photoshop, lots of people using that, almost 90%, but uh, nice to see a few people using Sketch. And some folks, a lot, half of you using Illustrator, that's, uh, that's cool, I use Illustrator too. I thought the XD might be a little more, a little more than that, but they really, they're, a little, they're behind. It's not quite ready for prime time. It's, it's not a bad program, I've, I've seen it, I've used it, I've kind of played with it a bit, but from a development perspective, I personally don't feel it's quite ready for prime time. I use this tiny PNG. Uh, I, I happen to, I don't know what I'm going to do as we move to Sketch, but I, I bought the Photoshop plugin. So when I do an export, I, it, it runs it through tiny PNG on the way out. And I found that to be real effective and efficient rather than going back later and trying to optimize a whole folder and stuff. Uh, so I definitely use it, but I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do as we move towards Sketch. So maybe it'll answer itself a little bit with, uh, to some degree with the SVGs, but there's still lots of images. I don't know. Image Optim I tried and uh, it was okay, but I wasn't overly impressed. I liked myself, I liked that tiny PNG better. Uh, fireworks, I, I didn't even know you could still use it. I know, uh, I guess you have the older version, that's fine. But uh, for what it did, it was, it was pretty cool. I wish they would have kept on with it. Be Funky, Lightroom, more fireworks, Figma, Pixlr, Image Alpha, Corel Draw, and Canva Ribbit. So Jack says uh, he's using fireworks to reduce the file size of the images. Alexander's in the process of learning XD, yeah. yeah. 
and Jeremiah's uh, enjoying XD. I, I like the possibilities of it. I definitely think uh, the prototyping side of things is is stellar. It's it's when you try and get stuff out of it that uh, it starts to fall down from a development perspective. But from a straight prototyping and and visualization, really cool tool. And Laura still has fireworks on one machine for files for image optimization. Pretty cool. So SEO, uh, the Google Keyword Tool. I thought that was interesting that. Uh, 85% of us are still using that. This uh, Screaming Frog I use and Longtail Pro I use, that, that one is, is me. I found that to be pretty powerful. Screaming Frog is interesting for, for checking your SEO. And then there's a, a cornucopia of singles here. Uh, I really thought this SEM rush might be higher. There only seems to be a couple there. Someone's using one of the App Store apps. Any big surprises there for folks? Is that kind of aligned with what you're doing in your agency? Maybe it comes down to how many people are actually doing full on work for SEO. Jack uh, has says it in the notes there that Fireworks is still available in Creative Cloud. It's just not getting updated. So you can still download it and install it. You just can't upload it. Yeah, there's some some thoughts that uh, Moz would would be up a little higher for sure. So just as a thought, how many people have SEO as a as a profit center in their business, or are they outsourcing that, or or just uh, sending sending their clients to someone else for SEO? Aaron's using SEO Toolbox, Screaming Frog, and other Google stuff. Yeah, so there's a bit of a mix there. Some are, uh, are moving it in-house. Uh, Aaron is uh, bringing it in as a core service. Jeremiah outsources it. I tend to outsource it. I'm not an expert in it, and uh, I, I, I do the best I can as far as building the site goes with, with hierarchy and all the rest of that and making sure that the, the meta tags are in place and such, and the open graph stuff works. But beyond that, as far as optimization goes, I, I tend to send them somewhere else. Alexandra, uh, they do it in-house and they come up with a process that's delivering great results. So if she doesn't mind, uh, Alexandra, if you, if, if you don't mind, if you throw your email address in the chat there, uh, and maybe people can contact you and, and talk to you about it and then maybe either become a customer or you, know, you, you can gain a, a partnership relationship with somebody. I'll leave that up to you if you want to do it or not. So this uh, email newsletter surprised me. Uh, I was expected the business catalyst to be high, but I, I really thought the MailChimp or even the constant contact would be higher. Uh, MailChimp higher than 30%. Uh, just because, and maybe it's because I'm seeing it on a fairly regular basis. One of the, one of the companies we do, uh, we do work for Chicago Digital uses MailChimp extensively. So maybe just because I'm seeing it a lot, but I really thought it would be uh, would it be a fair bit higher. And uh, autopilot campaign monitor, those are like Infusionsoft size. Those are those are major agency uh, programs. So I'm I'm not surprised to see only a few of those. But I don't know. Maybe I should have asked how many of uh, like what percentage of your clients are actually producing email newsletters. That might be a kind of a good follow up. If I was thinking about my own client base, yeah, it'd be pretty low. The number of people that are consistently outputting email newsletters is fairly low in the 25% range, maybe. So I'll give that some thought for, uh, for a follow-up. So screen recording, uh, it implies that you're actually doing some, but uh, this I show you HD and instant, that, that one is me. So lots of folks using Camtasia. The Zoom is higher than I thought, actually, at 30%. And then there's a, a various and sundry other ones. Screen, uh, Screencastify, Loom. I see Loom is up here as well. So there's five there, six, seven. So I haven't looked at Loom myself, but it might be worth looking at. Snagit and Jing, I've certainly been on the receiving end of some of those. Open Broadcaster. QuickTime and Skype, 
screencast matic Adobe Captivate, uh, interesting. Screen-O-Matic, Screencast, QuickTime. So Phil says, uh, newsletters are low, communication about events and other calls to action are high. Okay, I'd buy that. So it's still the same process, the same technique, but the, you know, it's, it's difference between an announcement, say, of, of an event or, uh, or, or an announcement for say, rather than, hey, here's the latest thing we wrote, have a look at it, is what I'm getting out of that. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I uh, use this, I, sh I show you instant, that's a Mac tool. I've been using it for a while. I've had a go at the Camtasia. And uh, it's like some other things, once you get used to something and it's working for you, then you just tend not to, to make the change. So because I have the license for that already, uh, maybe, maybe if that expires or I have to end up, up Pain to upgrade it, then I might move to Camtasia. But uh, video editing, because it's part of the package, again, probably no real surprise for me. Premiere Pro, um, and if if you have Camtasia, then of course you would use it to edit it. Although, yeah, seven people and six are using it for editing. That's fine. Uh, I use Audition for sound editing, so I, I like the integration from Premiere Pro. I right click, it says edit an audition. I take it out and uh, I do some basic noise reduction and, uh, and such, and then bring it back into Premiere Pro for, for completion. Yeah, Mike has said there, there'd be some, some split in the Windows versus Mac uh, screen capture stuff for sure. Although Camtasia is available for both, so. Yeah, I tend to mostly, I, because I do Academy and VC Guru stuff and uh, even some, some client end stuff, um, I, I tend to be editing videos at least once a week, sometimes more. So it was interesting to me just to see what, uh, what other folks are doing. So this uh, team communication I thought was interesting. Lots of folks using Slack, 30%. Uh, we certainly use it. Text messaging, yeah, get that. Uh, more people using Skype than I thought, almost 60%. Uh, Google Hangouts at 25%, and then a bunch of singles, Workflow Max, Trello, TeamGAN, phones. You can read the mirror Skype for business. Teamwork, email, Google Docs, Flock. I've never heard of Flock. Evernote, <laughs> shouting across the room, yeah, that's cool. Office 365 Teams, so there's a couple people with that. An active collab, which I've never heard of. So, uh, and again, I, everyone has 2020 hindsight. Maybe the follow-up question to this would have been how many people have remote teams that they need to communicate with where there's not everybody's in one office. Oh, thanks, Mary. You can watch the recording. Uh, have a great uh, rest of the day for yourself. Jump on that train, send me a recording of you, uh, you standing at the train station just because I get a kick out of that. That was just Mary saying she's got to leave early. So time tracking and invoicing. This uh, this was quite a mix here. I, I thought there'd be some more consolidation on this, and uh, and there is not. So I use Paydirt, um, and there's only one other person using that. Harvest, you know, a small percentage really. Seventeen percent is not that big, and then lots of other ones: Workflow Max, Freshdesk, Trello, QuickBooks. I'm not sure, QBO must be QuickBooks as well. Uh, teamwork.com, Teamwork Timer, Time Edition, Time Master, built-in BC for time tracking invoicing, that's cool. Uh, something Custom, Active Collab, ConnectWise Manager, Quicken, Sage Teamwork, Workflow Max Teamwork, Paper, uh, Hours Tracker, Phone App, more QuickBooks, not sure why that didn't consolidate with that one. Uh, studiometry, MYOB. Uh, MYOB was here for a while in North America and then it kind of went out of favor. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's like a, an Australian-based company. I might be wrong on that, but um, I did work with it for a while in, in my years in the telecom industry and it, it was, uh, I thought it was a pretty decent program, so I was kind of sad it went away. FreshBooks Sage, Toggle, Excel Spreadsheets, FreshBooks Active Collab, and Zero. I thought more people would be using Zero. I've, I've heard a lot about it lately and it seems to be pretty, pretty good. So I'll, 
I was surprised to only see one person using that. And then project management. You know, again, I was surprised here, the low percentage of people using, using Basecamp. Um, I'm wondering, 14 is 22, 25. It doesn't look like we have 55 responses there, so or 37 responses, if I just would have looked. So even, uh, even just that there's almost 20 of the respondents are, are not necessarily using a dedicated project management tool, I thought was interesting. So we definitely use Basecamp. Uh, we don't use Trello for, for uh, project management. We use it for tracking who's responsible for what any given week. We, uh, we all give weekly presentations. We all produce tutorials and we use Trello for keeping track of that stuff. But uh, for, for client projects, we use Basecamp. We were using Pipedrive for a while, but we're moving, uh, we're moving into something else, uh, HubSpot if it matters. Uh, Workflow Max, Team Gantt, again, a bunch of single stuff here. So I don't know, I was surprised by that. Be interested to know how you're keeping track of your projects if, if you don't have something dedicated for doing that. How are you making sure all the tasks get done in a consistent manner? Uh, is, it, is it all up in your head? Is it, is it because you're, you know, we're in general, a lot of us are smaller, smaller agencies? I don't know. Yeah, whoever shouts the loudest, that's cool. Yeah. So, Team Gantt does project management, sure. I like, uh, I like Bill. I just, when I was, when my kids were young, I used to be, uh, no one else would do it. So I'd be the umpire and I said, well, you don't have to be right, just loud. So for testing, browser stack, uh, lots of folks using that. This is uh, Tunnel Bear. I want to make sure people knew about it. I use that because I'm in Canada and I do have some clients who uh, have sites that appear different or provide different content. If you come from Canada versus you, if you went to their, uh, their, Dot com site. So I use Tunnel Bear to, to fake up being at an IP address in the, in the States to test those kinds of things. So I wonder if anybody else has, uh, has got a need for that, that kind of functionality. Tunnel Bear is the, is, uh, is the one. Google Page Insights, yeah, lots of people use that. The, the validator. I tend to use the validator to, to, to kind of find errors, open tags, and all the rest of that. I don't get too excited about some of its errors. It gets a little, uh, upset about some things that I don't think are that bad or, and even we don't think are that bad as a team. So I don't get too excited about the results, but I do definitely run my stuff through it. Uh, CodePen, JS Fiddle for sure. Facebook developer, lots of people checking their open draft tags and stuff with that. What is my IP? That's always cool. Uh, I use that even just for, from a testing perspective, I got a little snippet of liquid code that, that only shows content if, uh, if it's a certain IP address and because of, I work from a remote office, uh, my IP address changes. So I'll go there, get my whatever IP is, and I'll drop it into my code, and then uh, I'm able to test a live site without, uh, without affecting what everybody sees, just what I see. Can I use, I thought can I use would be higher. I thought more than 10 people would be using that. And maybe it's uh, just you got a level of comfort with what you're using, and you don't worry about it too much. Developer tools, plugins, browser checks. And uh, learning. So Code School. Uh, I use Code School. I've been I've been pretty happy with it. I'm just starting to use Trios because uh, some of the other folks at Chicago Digital have accounts and and they liked it. So I'm starting to use that. Lots of people using uh, Linda Stack Overflow. I learned a ton from Stack Overflow. If I'm searching for something uh, and I see a link from Stack Overflow, that's generally speaking the one I go to. Academy and Gurus. I apologize. I initially didn't put those in there. I'm not sure why. So I added them, I think, the next day. So there'll be some of them. Uh, I'm not sure if, it, if they all got consolidated. But uh, Udemy, Google Searches, Udacity, which I hadn't heard of. Combination of Udemy, BC Academy, BC Gurus, Code Academy, uh, UGurus, interesting. Google HubSpot, YouTube. BC Developer References, LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is interesting. That must be the BC Cafe. W3 Schools. And Google is our friend. Yeah, and Plural Site. Well, maybe Plural Site would be a little bit higher, but uh, 
These top ones are no real surprise to me. And this is uh, just straight other tools. So this uh, JS Beautifier, I'm glad to see lots of other folks using it. I use that all the time for, <clears throat> I use it particularly mostly for taking uh, BC form code. I pop it in there, format it, and then I paste it in the page and then do whatever conversions. Uh, realistically, I should, probably should look at, uh, at, buying, uh, at buying Scott's form builder, which, which would kind of take care of a lot of that for me, but uh, I haven't got around to that yet. Lightshot. Uh, I use all the time. That's a that's a screenshot tool. I find it real handy. There's a free version. Awesome screenshot. I use that sometimes. Uh, if I need to get the whole page, then I use awesome screenshot. If I'm just grabbing something on the page, then I use Lightshot. Uh, Royal Slider. I, I kind of toss these in here just to see what folks would uh, would say. Only a couple of people using that. Lots of people using Slick. Magnifique, Lightbox, Light Gallery. I'm moving gradually to Light Gallery. I kind of like it more than Magnifique. I used Magnifique for a long time. And then uh, a bunch of singles. Gulp, Screen Prezzo, Drop, Dropler, uh, BC Pi, Foundation Builder App, Muse Themes, Edge Animate, only one person, Office 365 and TechSmith Snagit, Revolution Slider, which I have used on one project. I, I kind of like that too. A lot of an, um, animation. So the, the, the image can come in and then the text can come in from different directions. You can, you have some options there. And then image optim uh, for an image compressor. And then uh, ask anything else worth mentioning. So we'll just kind of go through these. And uh, if, it, if it was you and you have more details, just uh, jump in the chat or grab the mic as I say. So jot form for form creation. I haven't used that, but that could be cool. Fresh desk for support ticketing and prototyping uh, wireframe. They're using XD. I hope they have applied up top there. Uh, peer support through Facebook groups. So maybe that took the place of the forums and, and that kind of thing. I, I do know on BC Gurus, the forum traffic there is, is way, way, way down. And I'm wondering if maybe this is what's taking the place of it. Uh, rocket typist for snippets. No, I haven't seen that one. I'll have to look that one up. Uh, live chat for Android phone and PC Windows. Uh, that must be if you got in the bottom corner and you, you can have a little chat thing come up. Conjure.io and proofme.com for approvals. So having a nice approval workflow. Chrome DevTools, Google Analytics, a Search Console, the Tag Manager. Bunch of Chrome, all the Chrome Dev tools for sure. Uh, I don't know about testmywebsite.org. I'm going to look that one up later. So Jack mentions in the chat that Lynda.com is now owned by LinkedIn, which is owned by Microsoft. Hmm. I'm trying to think who Microsoft is owned by, but I guess you don't go any higher than Bill Gates. So. And Dash for the Mac. What does uh, Dash for the Mac do? Dash gives your Mac instant offline access to 200 plus API documentation sets. All right, well, I'm not gonna gloss through that and, and try and see what it does. I'll let you investigate that on your own. And sure, everything in the survey sounds good enough to fill an hour presentation. I think we're gonna have no problem with that. And someone said, as tech has become more complex, you're more reliant on templates and such. That's interesting, because I was thinking about, uh, next week we're doing, we're doing a sample on uh, who's doing templates, who's doing custom sites. So uh, maybe whoever wrote that can come back and, and offer an opinion on that. So I'm working out my notes for that uh, for next week. And yeah, I got a lot more out of that, just out of the prep work than I, than I thought I was going to. I thought it was, uh, content was gonna be pretty slim and I ended up with a couple of pages of, of notes and stuff. So I think we'll be good. Uh, Envision, so I didn't put that up, up top. Uh, we definitely as Chicago Digital use Envision for prototyping. And uh, we use that for presentation to the client, for them to, to put notes on, for us to show some level of interaction. 
and lately um, it's been tied into Sketch and then we're able to export assets. If it's set up correctly, we're able to export our assets right from, uh, right from Envision. So that's becoming a, a larger component of my workflow for sure. Focus at will.com, music for the brain. So I use, uh, I have Sonos here and we subscribe to Apple Music and uh, I got some playlists and I definitely, I run Sonos through the whole, uh, through the whole place here in the kitchen and the bathrooms and stuff. So wherever we are, we got a little bit of music playing. Definitely agree with having some nice music there. Uh, Vimeo for video delivery. Definitely have, uh, has done some of that. Um, I've used also YouTube, of course, and uh, one other platform, Wistia. Is that one we use? Dash for docs. Is that the same dash up here? <clears throat> dash for docs. Someone said, to be honest, the vast majority of what I sell clients has to do with marketing their business rather than the site build and maintenance alone. Yeah, definitely a good point. So I spend uh, far more time on AdWords, social media services, Google business listings, SEO services, et cetera, et cetera. So that particular, uh, maybe that person outsources development and all the rest of it, and their, their focus really is on what they, uh, what they deliver as an end product, which we could fill a whole other sample with for sure. And the next, very next person said, my answers are based on a one-man band. I've been a one-man band. Uh, I currently work for Chicago Digital, but I had Digital Link Multimedia as a one-man band. And uh, interestingly enough, my tool set did not change significantly. Just, just some, as I, as I went through it and, and I mentioned, those are kind of the ones that changed. Uh, so we have a paragraph. Some, there needs to be a free tool that partners can use for clients who are tech illiterate to edit their sites. Uh, sure, I don't disagree with you. Um, someone can create it, but uh, it has to tie into Business Catalyst, and I do not see that happening in the near future. Real tough, real tough to make it tie in as a as an API from an API perspective. The closest thing, and, and this will sound biased, I, I I don't intend it to be, but it'll sound biased. The best thing I've seen in the last while is the Visual Content Finder. Uh, that's sold on the app store. Once you install it from an end client perspective for them to be able to just click on an edit link on the live site and it takes them right to the content they need to update. That to me was a game changer for, uh, for, for folks for sure. And I don't disagree with what you're saying here. Uh, I, I really wish they would update the back end and, and make it much easier to edit and all the rest of that. It's just not, uh, I, I just don't see it happening in, in the, in the future here. Someone else is just starting out. Team viewer for support. I, I'm not a, I haven't used that particular tool, so that might be worth looking at. A uh, good suggestion, always start by replicating a starter template so that they've evolved over the past decade. And now uh, that starter template, they all use Scott's Foundation Builder and Forms, which is not a requirement, but uh, definitely having a starter template that you use uh, to start with is, is is good practice. We definitely do that at uh, Chicago Digital. We have a foundation framework based starter template that Scott Schaeffer built out for us. Uh, we've minified a lot, a lot of the code in there. So we kind of stripped it down to just the things that we know we want to use. And then uh, if we need a component that was taken out, we just add it back. But for the most part, probably 90, 95% of the sites I, I build, I don't end up having to add anything back. So. Uh, yeah, Mike says perhaps that new nice editor app from Code Production. Uh, thanks for reminding me. I had forgot about that. So that may be that may be the future that was asked for. So for those that don't know, it's on the screen. It's called the Nice Editor. It's currently an open beta, so uh, you can install it for a one-time charge right now. And then once they take it out of beta, there'll be a monthly, probably subscription fee, but it looks like it uh, could have some potential for sure. I don't know. I, I'm not saying it's good, bad, or otherwise. I, I don't know how much overhead and such it adds to your site, but if it makes it much easier to edit, it's probably worth it. So whoever wrote that one should have a look at Nice Editor. Thanks for bringing that forward, Mike. I'd forgotten about that. Uh, this person said, Corel Draw is your secret weapon. 
You can design vector and export to pixels. That's interesting. So I haven't used CorelDRAW. I didn't know that. And then uh, their advantage, other advantages, their designs can be used for print and for web. So that's kind of cool. Surprisingly, I haven't seen more of that in the uh, in my travels. Not that I get everywhere, but someone asked, "How much do you outsource?" So this person outsourced all their CSS and HTML. So, you know, maybe along the lines of this uh, other person who said the majority of what they sell is their marketing and such, this person's maybe doing much the same thing. I mean, there's definitely uh, partners out there that are outsourcing some of their site builds and stuff uh, at Chicago Digital. We build sites for other, other partners. So, um, and some large partners at that. So definitely folks are doing that. And if development is not your thing, or you don't have the, the, the skill set available to you for that, well then definitely outsource it. Nothing wrong with that as long as you have a defined process and, and defined requirements and such. Someone else said Bootsnip, Dan's Tools, and then Avado, ThemeForest, and Code Canyon. That was one of the things I asked, I'll be asking next week is, uh, is how many people are using templates that are already BC integrated, like code production, like BC Gurus, and how many people are going out to ThemeForest or Code Canyon, getting an HTML template and, uh, and then bringing that into BC themselves. Someone else said, love this topic, thank you, that's good, I'm glad we worked it through. Loom and Active Collab are their current favorites, so I'm, I'm gonna have to go have a look at those two and just see if there's something I can use on that. And uh, they're going to have to watch the recording, apparently, because they have a client meeting right at this time. Now that we've gone through it, I'm going to see. I'll turn that on and just see what happens. So if you go back to that uh, URL, I think you should be able to get to all these results. So let me see if I can find the original link. I'm just pasting the, uh, the original link in here. So the theory is that you can go there and look at those charts yourself now, if, if I've read this, uh, this setting properly. So, so Jack has a suggestion, maybe BC Gurus could do a starter template similar to what Chicago Digital use to start the site. That is kind of the intent of the latest template bill. So this uh, Foundation 6 prototype, that is the intent of that. It may not be stripped back quite enough for you, for what you had in mind, but that's the intent is uh, this is foundation six with a minimal, minimal design, uh, more focus on getting the foundation functionality and such in there. And, uh, and that is the intent. Yeah, thanks, Bill. See you next time. So have a look at that, Jack, and uh, see if that's what you had in mind. So the survey's still showing. Okay, well, that didn't work out then. Uh, maybe I have to close that to not accepting responses. I don't know. Maybe do a refresh there, uh, Jeremiah, and see if, see what what you're getting now. Now that I've closed it from accepting responses. Ah, okay. Cool. Well, then uh, you can go back and kind of review anything that you wanted to have a look at. I'm glad that actually worked the way I hoped it would. Now, does anybody have anything else that you want to talk about as far as tools go? And, uh, Penny, this is just for John. I'll only show it for, for a moment here. So there's, uh, you can call him over. There's, there's some, of my, uh, some of my guitars. I do have a few more, but there's, those are, those are the, the main ones.
And he said, hmm, sounds like a shopping term. I have uh, what's commonly known as gas. I have bad gas and gas stands for guitar acquisition syndrome. <laughs> He's identifying him. That's uh, cool. I'd like to know if he knows what the blue one is. Uh, you can see the name at the top, I guess. But. So Mike says he's currently in the early stages of using Vue.js to develop a BC app. So far, so good. I haven't heard of Vue.js. So I've been uh, looking a little bit at, uh, at Angular and React, trying to figure out if it's something I can use or not. And I'm kind of in the same boat, Mike, where you're working around with it and trying to think, you know, am I, am I using it just for the sake of using it or is there is actually something, uh, something of use there? Yeah, I wondered, Penny, because you'd mentioned last week that he had a, he had a Godin, so. Yeah, that PRS is pretty special. That's, uh, oh, the figured maple top on that is something else. And you just, you drop it in your hands and it just feels right. Enough, enough of that to cause John to go on a shopping trip. Cool. Well, we got, uh, we got another five, 10 minutes here. If anybody wants to talk about anything else, go ahead and drop it in the chat or grab the mic. I'm worried now I got an email from Sonos that says uh, they're selling one of their speakers now with direct connection to Amazon Alexa. And I just don't know if I want to have something that's that connected in my house. I don't know what you guys think about that kind of technology. Like Alexa set a timer for 10 minutes. Alexa play this in the kitchen. I just, I just don't know if I want that. Yeah. Thanks Jeremiah. You don't. Yeah. I'm kind of with you on that. Thanks, Peter. I hope uh, you got some something out of that that made sense for you. Yeah, Jeremiah says, I don't need Alexa. I have seven kids. <laughs> Change the channel. Go to the dishes. Yeah, I had kids once. Now they're another now they're grown up and uh, I have grandkids now. So and they're not quite old enough to boss around. Now, I don't know. I don't know about that whole technology thing that just to be that connected to have some, some device have that much knowledge about you. I, mean, I suppose the knowledge is already there. If I'm being, uh, if I'm navel gazing, it's probably just using information that's, that it already has. And the Alexa is just the presentation format for that. I don't know. But... Yeah, yeah, the always on thing. That's uh, Jeremiah says the always on feature that makes them a little bit wary. You know, I, maybe I watch too much TV. You watch, uh, you watch CSI or any of these other shows where someone remotely turns the camera on and all the rest of that stuff and. So Jack says uh, they anticipate that voice search will reach 50% of all searches by 2020. I can, uh, I can see that. I mean, I, I have Apple TV, so that's frankly how I search on Apple TV. I push the, the little button, Siri comes up and I, and I say, find this, find that. So I'm, I mean, I'm already doing it and I'm resistant to it. So I can definitely agree with that. Yeah, no one knows how to spell anymore. That's a, that's a good point. So Laura has a question about API codes to connect BC e-commerce with a client database. What information does she need to know or what does she need to ask about? I do not have an answer for that, but maybe someone else that's on the call does. So Laura needs uh, some help with the API codes to connect BC e-commerce with a client database. Anybody can help her with that.
I'm just looking through my last bit of notes here to see if there's anything else that makes sense to bring forward. No, nothing really. Hi, Darren. Thanks very much. And if uh, no one's got anything else, then I'm gonna I'm gonna call it pretty quick here, because I am out of stuff to say. <laughs> You're welcome, Jack. Thanks. And again, uh, tune in next week where we're gonna talk about uh, templates versus custom code or code from scratch. So it could be interesting too. Thanks, Jeremiah.